Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully, you all can hear me well. Awesome. And we'll begin momentarily. I'll continue letting people in the room. And again, we'll begin momentarily about 10.03 to be exact. So. If you're just joining, good morning. We'll begin around 10.03, and I'll continue allowing people in the room as we begin. Actually, I'll officially begin in one minute. All right, we're going to officially begin with our morning session. So welcome to Cloud 12's Coffee Chat for District Leadership, Improving Professional Learning Communities, Part 2. Today is Thursday, February 16th, and this is our morning session. So I'm excited to see everyone here. Again, a little bit about myself. I have over 16 years in education before officially joining the Cloud 12 team. Served as a teacher, department chair, building administrator, district administrator, as well as state Department of Education committees. I have three years as a Cloud 12 customer. We expanded from an initial deployment to a district-wide implementation, so we're really excited about that. I also have my wonderful Cloud 12 customer success team, which includes Kelly Martinez, Director of Customer Success, Caitlin Day, Customer Success Specialist, Jamie Ulmer, Customer Success Operations Specialist, and Roxanne Bitterman, Customer Success Specialist. So we're just a wonderful team and here to provide any support that we possibly can to help you reach all of your goals. All right, so if you will, for just a moment, you can take this time to type your first and last name, roll in the district, district and school name, city name and location, if you're interested in doing that. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And again, you're just going to take a moment to type in the following um, chat space your first and last name, role in the district, district and school name, city name and location, and what do you hope to gain from today's session. And I'll read some of those as I go through. Welcome, Vicki Pierce. Welcome, Thomas Mott. Welcome, everyone else that is on the call. All right. So our objectives for today's meeting, we're going to first recap the four guiding questions of a professional learning community. We're then going to go into the essential standards, criteria, and protocol. We're going to go over questions to guide the work of your PLC. We're going to then finish up with some instructional practices, like a rubric for that and a guide, and then also data analysis, and then questions and brief discussion um, for those that want to participate in that. 
All right, so let's recap, and we're going to dive a little bit more deeper into this today because this is our part two of that session. Uh, instructional coach, Meriwether County, awesome, Vicki Pierce, and Thomas Mode, administrator at Troop County Schools in Garner Newman Middle School. Awesome, welcome. And I also see some people from my customer success team on here. I see Caitlin and Jamie and others as they're coming in the room, so that's awesome. So our PLC guiding and critical question number one, what do we expect students to know and be able to do? So in this particular question, you need to review state standards and align your curriculum. You want to identify the essential standards for each grade level and subject area using endurance, leverage, and readiness criteria. And I want you to remember that portion because that's the first part we're going to dive into today. So again, the first part of this, because we're trying to figure out what do we expect our students to know and at the same time be able to do. So review those state standards. You're going to align the curriculum. You're going to identify those essential or priority standards, however you want to call it, for each grade level and subject area using those endurance, leverage, and readiness criteria. Then you want to vertically align essential standards, looking for gaps and redundancies. On the Cloud 12 side of things, you want to make sure that during this stage, you're developing a Cloud 12 plan for expectations of your teachers and best instructional practices. And what do you expect them to do? How will they reflect on these practices? You want to also develop a Cloud 12 plan for the expectation of students and how they should respond in the classrooms. So we're looking now, are they truly engaged or are they just strategically compliant? So what that means is, for example, if a student is always sitting in class, always looks like they're paying attention, they're that kid that just sits up straight, uh, every time you turn to talk, it's like that one that you can just zero in on because they just give you that joy of teaching. But then when you get your scores back, you realize, wow, they had a 60 or they didn't actually understand the concept because they were just compliant. They're giving you exactly what we look for, but they're not actually engaged because there was no questioning that happened. There was no formative assessment that was happening, no cold calling. It was just based off of the gestures. And so we have to really devise a plan in looking at strategically, what do we expect students to do when the, to show that they're really engaged? It may be that they're answering questions um, every other you know, 10 minutes or so. They may be um, responding to prompts, writing on graphic organizers. We need to physically see um, and also get that response that they are actually engaged. You want to develop a plan for how frequent Cloud 12 reflections will be as well. So what's doable at your current PLC usage or stage and how can we advance that? So is this going to be two times a week analyzing a lesson or random snapshot? That second question of the PLC um, guiding question is, how will we know if the students have learned it? So now we've created our standards. We know what our essential or priority standards are, because again, those terms are interchangeable. You can say essential standards or priority standards. Uh, I say both, so I just switch back and forth, but they mean the exact same thing. But once we have those developed and we've developed that plan of knowing what's there, now we need to understand how will we know if they have actually learned that. So you want to unwrap each of these essential standards into learning targets and determine the learning progression. You want to develop common formative assessments for each learning target. So again, those common formative assessments, they need to be devised at the beginning because you want to begin with the end in mind. You want to determine proficiency levels, develop rubrics, create and share anchor papers with students, analyze assessment results, making sure that you have all of that. Again, on the Cloud 12 side, you to, to ensure how do we know they learn this, you want to develop a Cloud 12 plan for instructional review and goal setting through the video recordings. So you want to look at what does that instructional progression look like? And we're going to actually talk about that a little bit today. How can we reach our targets? You want to develop a Cloud 12 plan for collaboration with the video recordings. Have we shared lessons with our peers? Have we discussed the issues? Have we discussed the wins? Because you want to always celebrate your wins. 
You want to also develop a Cloud 12 plan for data collection using video recordings. So you want to look like, what do our conversations look like? What data are we bringing to our professional learning teams in regards to quantitative, which is the actual student data reports or et cetera, and that qualitative, which are those cloud 12 snippets and reflections. So you want to look at both of them because, again, the video is going to show me what their gestures were, what I was actually seeing in class, how they responded. But then when we see the test results, that's that actual quantitative data that is showing me what they actually receive because we can visually see it but the two need to match and so that's where cloud 12 and the plc really comes hand in hand question three and i'm going to talk about this and four together how will we respond if students have not learned okay so if they haven't learned we want to identify systemic responses for students who are failing or have not met the goals. We want to create interventions for students who daily to meet learning targets on common formative assessments. We want to group students for instruction by specific essential standards or learning target and evaluate the progress of students after their interventions. And again, that's something we're going to go a little bit more in depth today. Also on the PLC side of things, I mean, I'm sorry, the Cloud 12 side of things, my bad. You want to develop a plan for coaching and improvement based on reflection with Cloud 12 video recordings. So how will we respond to our Cloud 12 reflections on instructional practice? How can we improve our student outcomes? You want to also develop a plan for follow-up and action steps based on data collected with the video recordings. So what are your next steps after both individual and collective reflections? And what interventions and supports fit the needs that are shown? Um, and then again, on question four, how will we respond if students have already learned? So these are those students that master that standard, right? So you want to identify, same thing, systemic responses for students who have already mastered the essential standards. Create extension activities for students who demonstrate proficiency and above and evaluate student progress after the extension activity. Also, same thing with Cloud 12, developing that plan for that collaborative instruction and also developing a plan for lesson libraries as well using those video recordings, okay? So that kind of brings us up to speed now uh, with moving forward into part two and really diving in a little more deeper for this particular portion of the series. So again, with the PLC questions, that first one being, you know, how do we know, like, what do students need to know? What do they need to be able to do, right? Um, and that's kind of those nails and verbs, you know, what they need to know, that nail, uh, and you can look at that in the standard, that actionable verb, what do they need to be able to do? Um, that's that second portion of that. And then you want to be able to look at how do we know that they've learned that? How do we know that they've learned that? And then we want to look at the opposite spectrums of things. What will we do when they don't learn it? How will we respond to that? And then also on the other spectrum of that, what do we do when they've learned it, when they've mastered it? How do we accelerate them and enrich, right? So that's where we have to always have our concentration at. And again, that those are the first, the four, sorry, critical PLC questions. Got tongue tied there for a second. So let's continue moving. All right, let's get dive um, dive deeper in here. So with essential standards criteria, remember I said you want to look at that endurance, leverage, and readiness criteria, and that's what we want to dive into now. So when you're looking at the standards, trying to determine those essential or priority standards, with endurance, you have to first think about the standard. And when you're de deciding, because again, uh, I remember being an English teacher, um, and that's, you know, was my background before I moved into administration. Um, we had probably, you know, 55 standards or more. Um, and the reality is you cannot effectively teach every single one of those standards and expect your students to have proficiency or be distinguished in that. You have to divide, decide what are those priority or essential standards and how we're going to meet them, 
right? Also, what standards can we umbrella under a master one? Okay, so you have to look at that. And the way you do that is you first want to look at the endurance level of it. Is this a standard that is knowledge and skills of value beyond a single test day? So, for example, I have to know, is this standard something that they're going to actually need to know beyond just the test that I'm giving this Friday? Uh, and I'm going to take you back in time. Although I think there are some value in spelling tests and things of that nature. If you can think back to when you were like in, you know, first grade or second grade and you always had a spelling test on Friday um, and you would learn those words, you would study them, you would spend so much time trying to learn those words for um, the test, right? And then what would happen? You would take that test on Friday, forget about it, and they never got asked again. You know, unless you had that tough teacher that reviewed, you know, like 50 in a, at one time later on, <laughs> and you got kind of caught up there. But you were always given a stack of words that you studied, didn't learn them later on, right? It's the same thing here. You want to have a standard that is not just something that is going to be for a single test date. It needs to be something that is long lasting, something that has life to it, something that is um, enduring. Um, as the thing says, endurance. So will this standard be employed exactly as it is in life beyond the school walls? Okay. So you also want to have standards that are essential that have meaning to them. Things have to have purpose behind them. If you're teaching something just for the sake of covering curriculum, that's not good. It has to be something that lives in curriculum lives in the lives of students, and it's something that is long-lasting, something that has relevance, meaning behind it. Does it represent how things are really done? So that's another thing as well with that endurance. Moving on, leverage. With leverage, you want to have the knowledge and skills of value in multiple disciplines. So does this standard, um, can it be applied in other disciplines, right? For example, the skills with it. Um, in English, if I'm teaching textual evidence, I'm having to take what I read and really get understanding from it, get meaning from it, analyze it. I'm having to take the time to read it, break it apart, uh, and then I can extend beyond that, right? I can take that, compare it, do a lot of things with that in textual evidence. Is that used in other things? Yes, it is. In a math class, for example, you have to be able to read those problems, make sure that you understand them, then you need to analyze those, and then you take them even further. Same thing with science, right? If I'm in a um, chemistry lab, I need to make sure that I understand all of my equations, balance all of the elements and all of that. If if I have hydrogen, if I have one element of hydrogen and one element of oxygen, am I going to then make water? No, I'm not, right? Because when I analyze it, I have to have two elements of oxygen with that one element. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have to have one particle, sorry, of that ox um, hydrogen along with two of them of oxygen to be able to have that water effectively. And that only comes from me analyzing and having that critical skills of that. So again, you have to have the leverage. Is the standard transferable, as I was just saying, and even necessary for learners to access skills and content in other areas and fields? Exactly what I was just saying there. Also readiness, right? Um, um, also readiness. So you have knowledge and skills necessary for success in the next grade level, the next instruction level, or the state test. Is the standards a building block that other standards are contingent upon? So is this something that's going to build upon itself? For example, as I was just saying with textual evidence, um, I'm not just going to analyze and learn the plot structure, right? I'm going to build upon that and then get into that uh, internal and external conflict and break that down even more. I'm going to then break down more into tone, right? And then that's going to take me to theme, right? And then that's going to take me to characterization and just a lot of different things, everything umbrellas, and it keeps building upon itself. You don't want to just have a standard um, 
like arch archetypes, for example. Archetypes is something um, in English as well, where you talk about like an angel versus devil or um, an elf of symbolism, basically. Uh, it's not exactly symbolism, it's a type of symbolism. But I digress. With archetypes, you want to make sure that's not a standard that is long lasting. It's a good standard and it's a good to know standard. And that's something that I may teach, but it's not going to be an essential standard. They do not have to know that before they move to the next grade level. Do they have to know textual ev evidence and all the elements of that? Yes. If I was a math teacher, do they need to know um, polynomials right now? Um, in the eighth grade? Yes, they do. Do they necessarily need to know sine, cosine, and tangent in eighth grade? Absolutely not. That's something that may be essential or may become essential in like the 10th or 11th grade when it's more applicable to that. Is it something nice to know that can help them later in life? Absolutely. But it is not essential. So that's where you have to have that mindset at. All right. And with essential standards protocol, you want to have collaborative teams um, to use this criteria and identify about six to 10 standards per subject or per grade level. This can vary. For example, um, in English, you know, you have a million standards, but you may narrow them down to like seven essential standards, right? Um, some teams may narrow it down to four. Um, in science, you may narrow it down to like five that you have, or even four maybe, because of what you're talking about. They may be all essential at that time, or you may do them in a heavy unit. It doesn't matter, but you don't want to have more than like 10 essential standards, because then you move into just regular curriculum. Again, we're going to look at all the curriculum when we're building this platform of our PLC, when we're building our what we're going to actually teach and what our students need to know and what do we do when they don't respond to that and what do we do when they do respond very well, we're going to look at all of that. But there has to first be a section of that standard. Individual teachers decide the absolutely essential standards using the endurance, leverage, and readiness criteria. And teams discuss and reach a consensus on the essential standards, right? Also, teams consult testing information to determine alignment. So you want to look at your test specifications, your blueprints, content limits, and you want to record those selected standards that you have there. All right, so here are some questions to guide the work of your PLC, okay? So you want to really reflect on this as you're doing it. Remember, we've already talked about our questions. We know how to start doing that process of that. But when you have that, you also have to now decide as an administrator, as a school leadership team or that guiding coalition, here, here's how we got the work of our PLC. We really have to ask ourselves these questions and be truthfully honest and reflective of these questions. So have we organized our staff into collaborative teams? You know, have we set them into collaborative teams? Have teams been organized on the basis of common courses and common grade levels whenever it's possible? Right. Um, and it all depends on what's best for your for your school. Um, I had um, I was actually with a school this week where she said that in their PLCs, because right now she's trying to have a little bit more variety and she also wants it to work with the time. She actually just does it based off of their planning period. You know, everyone that has first period planning kind of plans together and, and works in collaborative with that PLC. Everyone that has second period does the same thing. Um, one of my favorite things to do is base them by grade level and subject, if you're able to do that. Because I really feel that a strong PLC would obviously be the entire math department, but an even stronger, I'm sorry, I messed up my own words here. Uh, remember, the PLC is the school, right? It's everyone collectively. But these PLTs, okay, those professional learning teams, you want to make sure that you have them in the right teams, right? So although a math department is powerful, it is more powerful when you have all of the seventh grade math teachers together, right? You can get a lot more accomplished there, uh, especially when it comes to the curriculum. If we've used the interdisciplinary team structure, which is what I'm talking about, have team members identify specific and overarching student achievement goals? And do they use those goals to guide their work? Excuse me. Um, so that's, that's an important factor there. 
Past specialist teachers and singleton teachers found meaningful collaborative teams. So this may be like a band teacher or an agriculture teacher. You don't want them just on their own island, even though they teach, they're only one that teaches them the subject. You may put them on a team with other um, connections teachers or exploratory teachers. That may make sense for them to collaborate and share their data. It may make sense for them based off something that they do in class. For example, um, if I'm the, the band teacher, um, I may find some relevance some way in the English department and what they're doing. You want to place people with who they're going to most collaborate with and get the most value from that. You don't want anyone by themselves. Um, have we avoided assigning people to teams whose disparate, uh, disparate sorry, assignments make it difficult, if not impossible, to focus on the critical questions of learning? So you don't want to have someone on the team where it's going to be a distraction to them to be on that team or they're going to distract others from the work. Um, and I'll give you a prime example. Um, I had a teacher once in a building that was, oh, you know what, let me not say that subject um, to identify that person, but let's just say they were on the connections team, you know, I don't remember who's all on here, so there's someone on the connections team, and they were, they were like, I teach this particular subject, I don't teach math and, and this other subject here, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, even though it did make sense with the topic that they were going in, we had to remove and rethink about that, not because it didn't make sense, but because their attitude towards it, the way they felt that it didn't belong, we had to look at that, right? And place them with someone that they were going to best work with because you don't want any distractions or anything to take away from that. Have we provided time for teachers to meet in their collaborative teams on a regular basis? You have to build time into the schedule. Do teams focus on the identified critical questions of learning? Are the teams asked to submit specific um, products according to a designated timeline, right? Do these products reflect their focus on the critical questions? What systems are in place to monitor the team's work and effectiveness in a timely manner, right? Has every team developed explicit norms that clarify the commitments members have made to one another regarding how they will work together as a team, right? Because we have to all believe and work together and have those norms in place. Do the team members honor these norms that they've established? Have they established a process for responding when a member fails to honor the norms? And have we given teams the knowledge Space, time, and support essential for their effectiveness. That's important, okay? This right here, and I'm excited to move into this section. This right here is an example of the classroom walkthrough protocol, okay? So with this, you see this is a cutout of a worksheet that you could use when you walk around the classroom. It's very standard uh, from the Solution Tree site. Um, you're going into a class, writing that time and the date down. You want to make sure you capture the standard and the objective and maybe the student learning targets if they're visible. But you want to just look at everything that happens in the class, right? If it's a small group activity, if it's a teacher talking and lecture, whatever it is, you want to write down that activity. And, you, and this is like uh, a variety of columns down the list, but they're all blank. It's just a bunch of columns. And it says, what is the activity or task? So what's happening right now? That's the first thing. And then you want to look at what is the teacher doing? And then what are the students doing? Um, I had a lady, um, Polly Patrick. I can't really, I just remember the lady's name. But Polly Patrick was a... Uh, uh, um, instructional consultant um, that would come around and she used to always say every single time as an administrator, always look what are the students doing? What is the teacher doing? Because who should be doing most of the work and the talking? It should be the students, not the teacher. And that's why you get to the end there of that sheet and you have the percentage of time the teacher is talking, modeling, or doing the work and the percentage the time the students are talking 
practicing and doing that work, right? It should be a very big balance. And I always love to say 80-20, uh, even more if you can get to that. But students should be doing at least 80% of that work, right? The teacher is there for that 20% to help guide and facilitate and make sure everything is going well. And that takes a lot of prep work on the teacher to run that effectively. But when you do that, there's so much that is accomplished there. And let's dive a little deeper into the instructional practice. Practices. So here, and we're going to look at the beginning compared to the embracing because it's a spectrum. So when I look on the left hand side here, and I hope you all can see that well. Um, okay, awesome. Um, when I look at this from the left to the right, I see the beginning and then also the embracing. You have beginning, attempting, practicing, embracing. So when I'm looking at instruction, I look at the classroom culture, right? A lot of times we see teachers that every time something's done wrong, they look at that as bad. And this is on the students and them. When they see a mistake, oh, that's just a bad thing. And they mark it all up and they shut the students down. Like the hope is lost there. All the students sit in rows. And, you know, we see this. Uh, and it's okay, like during testing or something to have students in rows. But if you have you ever walked into a teacher's room and every single day, Every student's desk is exactly the same. It's always in a row, straight. That's just such order or whatever. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that's for classroom management. Actually, I feel that when I see teachers uh, with their rooms in different directions and they students are moving around and working and it's facilitated well, that to me speaks more volumes of classroom management than me walking into a room where it's just silent and everyone's in a row. And teachers establish routines and procedures for movement in the classroom, but not necessarily for expectations during learning. And what that means is they're always like, raise your hand if you have something to say. Sharpen your pencil before class gets started. Um, sorry, those type of things, right? So that's what you're um, making sure you have there, sorry. It's the name coffee chat, although I'm drinking Gatorade. So, <laughs> uh, beginning there, so you have those mistakes through there. But what you want to have is embracing, right? Teachers see mistakes as opportunities for learning and embrace them in a manner that encourages all students to try any task. Students sit in groups and learn from and challenge one another. That's the goal of a good culture. And teachers and students establish and practice routines and procedures for learning, right? What does learning look like? And this is a good plug here for Cloud 12 as well. When you're looking at those classroom videos and you're reflecting, I want you as teachers and administrators to look at what's actually happening. Who's doing all the movement? Is it the teacher? Who's doing all the talking? Is it the teacher? Or is it the student? How can students be actively engaged if the teacher will not give them the opportunity to be actively engaged? So a question there, right? Teachers and students need to have those routines for what learning looks like. Um, that's why I love Socratic seminar so much. And Socratic seminar is a cringe-worthy strategy, but you have to allow the students to voice and have their opinions there. I'm not a just opinions, I'm sorry, but voice their instructional and academic achievement. That's what you want. You want learning to take place, rigorous learning at that. Also, when it comes to first best instruction, lesson design, right? That instruction is lecture only. That's the bad side, right? Um, the lesson is the same for all students throughout the entire class period and block of time. Everyone does the exact same thing. And this is where you begin to lose your gifted students, right? Because if everyone's doing the same thing, most times they already know it, so they're bored by it. They'll do it and then put it down, or they won't attempt it because they're not challenged by it. Um, or your lower-level students are sitting there struggling because they don't understand it. They can't comprehend it. It's not broken down or scaffolded accordingly. You want to keep it at grade level, but make sure that you scaffold it accordingly, um, not lowering it down but making sure they have the right resources and strategies to be able to comprehend and understand and achieve it. Um, 
the lesson focuses on an activity rather than a standard. As I said before, as a teacher, you know, I used to do my poetry cafes and it was wonderful. People came from far and near. We had great times. But as I grew and became a better teacher, I had to realize I had to cut that out or edit it because sitting around standing reading poems and in Rotel Dip <laughs> is fun, but it is not achieving a standard, right? Um, if I were in art class and all I did every day was just draw and paint randomly, you know, just freestyle painting and stuff, it's a good activity. You may become a great artist one day. But if there's no structure there, if they're not learning about the correct mediums to use, um, if they're not learning the history and how it evolved and how that could affect them today and their mindset, because they need to see the trajectory of how art has evolved over the years and what is looked at as art, it's not going to be successful, right? Um, and then there's no closure present, right? A lot of times teachers just say, okay, well... We had a great day in class today. Go ahead and pack up. You got seven minutes left of class. Uh, make sure you stay seated. People get on their phones, fights break out, all of those things happen because it's lack of structure. That's a beginning level, right? That is not best practice. What you want to see happening is teachers acting as facilitators, managing some direct instruction with more student-led involvement. And again, that takes practice and research and it takes lesson planning, right? Um, teachers have to plan for intervention and enrichment. You can't just let it happen, right? As I said, back to those four critical PLC questions, you have to think of that in advance. Like, here's the standard. Here's what we want people to learn. But what do we do if they don't learn it? What do we do if they already know it? Like, you have to have that in, in plan. That helps you avoid um, chaos. Teachers tie the lesson to a standard and students understand and can articulate the connections in the lesson to the unit and other units. Students experience different levels of rigor and productivity and productive struggle, basically, as necessary. They have to have productive struggle. It's okay to, to have them wait. A lot of times as teachers, when we ask the question, we pause for a moment and then we get nervous because we're like, oh, no one's talking. I don't want any disruptions to happen. Let me move on. No, if you've set those procedures in place for behavior and you set procedures in place for what learning really looks like and how we're going to do that in this class, in this culture, then it's okay for them to have that struggle that is productive, right? Bring other people in. Let's say, okay, well, no one knows the answer right now. Let's pause on this. Let's, let's go back and look at X, Y, Z. Let's give them some more foundation, some more scaffolding. I'm not going to tell them the answer, but I'm going to provide the resources where they'll be able to attain that answer, right? Or what we're looking for. And students close the lesson. I love this. Students close the lesson and reflect on their understanding of the learning target. So they need to be the ones who do those summarizations. The students need to have the ticket out the door, right? I love, I used to love as a teacher, uh, I used to call it a Twitter post, right? At the end of class, a lot of times my students would have to summarize um, what they gained and like what was the most important concept of the classroom. And they had to summarize it and put it in, I won't say the wrong thing, but like 60 characters or something like it was, or less than 100 characters, something like that. That's periods, the the words, everything, like a hashtag, right? They I only gave them so many characters. That's hard because you have to really analyze, think about it, and dive it into the most important segment. That's critical thinking. And the students loved it because it was a challenge for them. Sometimes I did KWL. Sometimes we went around the classroom doing different things. But I always had students summarizing and closing the lesson. Um, and the activating strategy, which I didn't say that earlier, that's something you want to have to open that class and have that positive. Let's keep moving. Also, on the other side of instruction, when it comes to first base, uh, first best uh, instruction with the disclosure, teachers are the primary person talking in the class. Mm. Teachers ask right their questions, which mask the language in the text, right? Um, for example, someone tell me uh, what color shirt Pony Boy had on in The Outsiders. Great. What about the other person? Why did they do that? Okay, good job, guys. Let's here's a piece of candy. Let's move on. Um, and I've actually witnessed a teacher who 
did that very thing. Um, she would even have them pause at a certain point, and if they could tell you where you were, she was like, great job, you got a piece of candy. That was motivating them to stay, I guess, awake with the lesson. It was working to a degree, but there was no learning taking place there, and that's what's so important. And students only learn from the teacher, right? What you want to see happening is teachers and students pose questions. Did you notice what it said there? Teachers and students pose questions in class. And they listen and respond fluidly to the answers, right? This is a give and take. We're all in this together. And the teachers had to become part of the lesson, right? And allow the students to really help lead that. And you're guiding that. You're facilitating that process. Students initiate conversations as necessary to learn and make sense of the standard. You want to present it where they're able to pose those questions, right? And that only comes from you taking that time in your lesson to structure that. Um. Best, um, sorry, when it comes to formative process, teachers focus on finishing a lesson and do not check student work or think to provide quality feedback. They're just trying to move through and get it done, right? Here's a quiz, boom, boom, boom. The students don't get that quiz back till like two weeks later, right? So sad. Lessons do not provide opportunities for visible and audible student thinking that teachers can give quality feedback to quickly and effectively, Right? And I'm, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm guilty of that as a teacher years ago. I mean, numerous years ago, but I'm still guilty of it. I've given my students an assignment that I knew I wasn't going to grade, that I, I didn't even care about. I just needed them to be quiet and silent while I got something else done, right? Um, we don't want that because what's the purpose of that? Teachers need to constantly provide feedback to students, and students provide feedback to one another throughout the lesson. That's real practice, right? You're pausing throughout. Um, you're pausing throughout. You're having a lot of conversations, right? You're moving throughout the day to make sure that you are positively uh, making an impact. Teachers and students see and hear one another's thinking, and they work together to learn, okay? We have to all work together and think. Last one on this one, when it comes to response to student learning. The, the non-effective way is collaborative teams discuss student learning, not always using data. So <laughs> when we're thinking about our students, we're just talking about them. We're just talking about them, um, but we're not really... Um, we're not really using any data at all. We're just having conversation and we're making individual plans after that discussion to address student learning. That does nothing. Have you ever been in a meeting? Well, I'm just saying this as opposing, but there are teachers a lot of times where in a school they'll they'll sit, they'll think about, hmm, yeah, those kids didn't learn anything. I, they all failed. Most of them failed. Well, I know I taught the lesson. Um, so these kids just need to get it together because I'm not going back and redoing that. That's sad, but that is the reality of what happens a lot of times in buildings because there's no accountability there. There's no real push in the PLC to where learning is for all and high learning for all, right? What we want to see is collaborative teams analyzing data. You should, As I said last time, and I said it today, I believe, you want to be coming to your PLC meetings with your Cloud 12 clips, you know, bringing like uh, a couple 10-minute clips that you've reflected upon. You want to come with data. And uh, I actually had the best conversation with a teacher in South Georgia this week, uh, um, um, with an, I'm sorry, an instructional coach this week, of you want to make sure that you're looking at the video clips and reflecting on those through Cloud 12. And you want to also make sure that you have student data there, right? So that I can match up and align what I saw on cloud 12 to what I actually received back in my data. Because I promise you when you start to look at that, and another thing, you have to change your thinking. A lot of times in schools, we say cloud 12 is really about that teacher reflection, right? And it is. But I think there's some misconceptions there at times when it comes to teacher reflection. Teacher reflection isn't just you simply looking at what you've done in class and how you've ran it and how can you be a better teacher. You need to really look at your students. 
And that also helps with the culture of bringing in Cloud 12. You want to look at your students. What are my students doing? Are they learning? Are they achieving the goals that I've set before them? If they're not, what can be done to change that? Are there any barriers in the room that are affecting their learning, right? That's how you really reflect, not just on yourself, but think about what's happening in your room with the students. And that is going to make you better yourself with that instruction. And make sure that you use data to monitor the effectiveness of each. Okay, that's powerful. You have to do that. And finally, we have the data analysis protocol. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is something that is a real PLC work. Now, I worked at a school some years back. I'm not going to say the name, but I'll never forget. Um, now, I've, I've come from different backgrounds, thankfully. I've had a, a great career. Um, it was a pretty strong educational career. And I remember when I was in one school system, a particular school system, when I got there, we had a big, thick notebook where a page was dedicated to every single student that I taught. And at that time, I had about 145 students a day. We had a single page for every single student, and it was just filled with data. We knew their demographics. We knew their history. We recorded all of our test results, all that. It was a lot. It was a lot, uh, and it was tough. And thankfully, later on, our principal removed that level of process because we had some of us had to go. We had to go through it to really appreciate our data uh, and really get a close eye. But it was just a little too much and overbearing at times for some teachers. Um, but I'm thankful for that process because I knew I came from somewhere that was strong. This right here that is used by PLC and Solution Tree is very minute to a person who's gone through that. Uh, but this can be highly daunting for a school that has not had any data talks or any kind of conversations around data, right? So I'm going to show you this, but please keep in mind, this is something you might want to ease on your staff as they grow within the PLC, add elements of it, because this full sheet here is really not that bad, but it can be daunting for someone first seeing it. So when you're looking at data, you want to determine the percentage of students proficient on the assessment for each standard and target by teacher, and then all students within the team, right? And this right here is just something that you do as a team, your PLC, your, your PLT, your professional learning team. So you have your percentages, right? This is essential standard one. This may be essential standard two, three, and four, depending on what you're talking about at this particular time. Because again, you may have essential targets that you're hitting, but you may not hit, do just like one main target at one time. You may be hitting on different components. And this can be something that continues to grow as you go on. So you may only talk about one target during the time and that keeps it um, effective. For each of those standards and targets, you wanna determine the number of students who are proficient. Uh, close to proficient, far from proficient, uh, proficient, and so on. Now, for me in Georgia, I would have to edit this to be four calls because I would want to know who's my um, developing and beginning. I would want to know who's proficient, and I would not know who's distinguished. But you could also use those three categories because now that I think about it, beginning and distinguished, uh, beginning and developing is basically the same thing because neither one of them is passing, right? You have to be proficient, and that's how the CCRPI is looking at that, right? <clears throat> wow, sorry. I'm down camera here. Um, <laughs> that'd be awful, right, to be watching the Zoom, and I just like to the French. Um, but <clears throat> data analysis protocol, sorry. <laughs> um, with that, you want to make sure that you're looking at the number of students in that regard. And then you want to finally look at these questions from that. And you do this as a team. What skills did the proficient students demonstrate in their work that set their work apart? So when I'm looking at their work, what did they do? Or how did they act that set their work apart? So for example, if I'm analyzing a poem, if I have students that failed the, the poetry analysis exam or test that I'm given, or they're analyzing a poem, and they're just writing like a word or two in the corner and circling some stuff throughout the poem. 
that may not have good skills. But if I see where the students that made like 90s and above or even 80s and above, they had things circled, underlined, highlighted. They had extensive notes all in the margins and things. They really annotated. If I see that, then I know they spent their time. They really took time to dive in and analyze it and their work proved effective, right? But you can look at it in two ways because if I had students that did all that and didn't be and weren't successful, that's something to analyze as well, right? In which area or areas did my students struggle? In which areas did our team students struggle? What was the cause? How do you respond? What strategies will we try next? Do you see how this is conversation? This is a guide that you can use in your PLC and it comes straight from the solution tree, the PLC experts. Um, you're, it's a lot of questions here. This is where those PLT or those, you know, professional learning teams within that PLC come to fruition. Which students need additional time and support to learn the standards and targets? What is our plan of action? Notice how everything always has a follow-up. Which students need extension and enrichment? You identify them and then you say, okay, now what is our plan for that? And do these data show that we're on track to meet our SMART goal? Because you want to have a SMART goal from the beginning, right? Why or why not? Do you all, I hope you're understanding how this is how um, that true professional learning comes to fruition, how it really comes to talk there, okay? And at this time, I'm going to... Now you're allowed to unmute yourself. Um, are there any questions or comments or anything based off anything we've said today? What I've said today? Any comments or questions? Okay. If not, moving. All right, and I just want to thank you for attending. Uh, for any follow-up questions that you may have or to set up a meeting for your district leadership team, you can contact me via email at emmanuel at cloud12.com. You can also set up a direct meeting on my Calendly link um, at calendly.com forward slash Emmanuel Reddish. And we thank you so much for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful day.